There is an important ratio in the world of comedy. The more offensive a joke is, the funnier it becomes for all kinds of reasons. Cultural reasons, psychological, religious, social, political, you name it. But you better not take that risk with your audience and flop. So the more offensive a joke is, the funnier it has to be. On the flip side of this is uh, the clean comedy, clean uh, comedians. Stand-ups like Jim Gaffigan, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, even the most offensive comedians will tell you a clean comedy routine is much harder than the offensive to funny ratio. Because while offensive comedy allows the comic to see just how far they can take it, clean comedy requires the comic to let the joke loose by reining it in. Today's guest is a clean comedian. He has been performing since 1978. He most likely coined the terms happy wife, happy life. And would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? Over the course of his nearly five decade career, he has become a master at clean comedy. But he's also a clean comedian. Clean as in clean and sober. It wasn't always that way. In fact, he had some real demons to wrestle with. Now in his book, Are We There Yet? My Journey from a Messed Up to a Meaningful Life, he's telling the entire story, including some of the darkest moments of his life, his rock bottom as he fought addiction to alcohol and cocaine. He has an amazing life and an amazing journey that I think you might be able to relate to in some way or another, but also learn from. Please welcome my friend, Jeff Allen. Did you know that we actually see with our brains and not our eyes? Your brain constantly senses what's happening around you, fills in so much. How and what we see not only depends on the strength of our own eyes, but it also helps the brain make optimal decisions. This is why you need as much field of vision and peripheral vision as possible. Vision is so important to humans that almost half of our brain's capacity and 25% of our day's energy is dedicated to our eyes, visual perception. I, my eyes have started fading long ago and I have Rodenstock biometric intelligent glasses. And they, it's, it's amazing. It helps your brain adapt almost instantly. You don't have to go home and get used to your glasses. They are natural. They're relaxing. And it helps you see everything. It, it will give you a seamless visual experience and acuity, unlike you've had with any other glasses. Biometric intelligence glasses with artificial intelligence from Rodenstock at Better Spectacle. You will have seamless vision no matter where you look in your glasses. Schedule your teleoptical appointment and get your glasses for 61% off now at betterspectacles.com slash back. That's betterspectacles.com slash back. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Mr. Beck. How are you? <laughs> it's good. Good to have you here. Yeah, it's nice to it's be here. It's been a while since you've been here. Yeah, uh, you finally dropped the charges and yeah. you let me come back. I was, <laughs> yeah, I, know. I was hanging around so much, I yeah. think I became a nuisance. You so. are, uh, uh, you're doing fabulous, fabulous stuff yeah, right now. Yeah, at this point in my life, which is great, because when it ends, I can just retire. <laughs> <laughs> I told Tammy, I said, you know, if I hit this at 35 and it runs for five years, I got a lot of years to try to figure out how to get it back. <laughs> Is success, do you think, sweeter at your age now? It's, uh, I don't know if it would be sweeter. It's just nice, again, if it, it's a good run. If yeah. it, and when it, I'm 67, so if I can make it to 70, wow. you know. And, you're, and, uh, and you, man, you look uh, a thousand years younger than Joe Biden. Yeah, well, you know? I have a lot less stress. Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to hide uh, yeah. in, in 16 offshore accounts. Holy and, cow! You know, I Holy have one cow. bank account. Yeah, <laughs> you know? you've written a new book, um, and it's called "Are We There Yet?" Yes. And uh, I've read it, and I want you to t I want you to take us through the story 
um, and are we there yet actually comes from something. I'm an alcoholic. You're right. an alcoholic. It's so a recovery. We're, yeah, we're a couple of recovery or yeah. recovered dirtbags. Um, where does are we there yet come from? It's the journey. I, I, I had this image of when I started recovery of being like a child. I walk into those rooms. I had no idea what it meant, where I was going. And I was not in charge of anything. I did what I was told to do. They told me to pray. I didn't believe in God. I said, all right, I'll pray. So it's interesting. I did the serenity prayer and I did the third step prayer for years, not even knowing what they meant, you know, especially the third step prayer, which is what my life is today. You know, remove me from the bondage of self so that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties so that victory over them. Others may bear witness to thy strength, thy power, and thy way of life. Mm -hmm. So I did what I was told like a child. So when I was putting the book together, I started thinking, you know, it really is a journey. And you are like in your parents' car in the back seat. Yeah. And recovery's like they leave you at a rest area with the keys and say, yeah, have a nice life. <laughs> and, yeah. And you have no idea what direction yeah. to go, where to go, and you make mistakes along the way. And, and I'm in the impatience. I don't know of other people in recovery, but I had, I mean, I went to therapy and my first question was, how long do I got to do this? I don't yeah. want to come to you the rest of my life. I know. And she said, fortunately, God gave me a wonderful therapist. She said, uh, my goal is to get you to fire me as soon as possible. That's great. You know, when you can be your own therapist, you don't need me. So I know that one of my problems was um, I started drinking, same age as you, 13. Oh. Uh, and um, uh, But I was successful uh, early on and uh, for whatever that means. And my am I there yet was different. Mine was, I'm supposed to be happy now. Right. I, no, I, I've accomplished this. So it must, be, it must be that over there that I need. And you never, ever hit that. Right. Does that make sense to you? Yes, Do you know it what made 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, would, I remember early knowing it wouldn't be money. I was you know, drinking, and, and, and um, I remember telling everybody when I got into comedy, I quit a job making $300 a week. So I'm 22 years old, and I said, if I can make 300 a week telling jokes, man. So I hit that pretty quick. Mm. Then it was 500 Then it was 750 a 1000 15 I got up to like 2000 maybe in the clubs a week. And I was money. pissing it away. Yeah, I was just spending it on coke and drugs and whatever, you know. So I knew in my heart of hearts— no matter how much money I made, I remember saying, if I hit the lottery and the Illinois lottery came in, my response was, I'm going to buy a silo full of cocaine. <laughs> 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 and I mean, I'm a young adult. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not 16. I'm yeah. 25 years old going, I'm going to buy a silo. So, you know, thank God I didn't win yeah. the lottery. Oh, I know. I know. You know, but that was, so I knew that. So my there was, okay, maybe if I can just get the Tonight Show. And I remember guys saying to me, what are you going to do after you get to Tonight Show? Yeah. I don't know. Well, one Tonight Show ain't going to, you know, but right. back then, if Johnny gave you the come to the couch. on the back, you know, but still, I, I didn't have a plan. I talk about that in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I was a planless, you know, and when I married Tammy, I asked her to marry me at baggage claim. Yeah, well, let's get into that yeah. for a second. First, when you, you just brought up uh, Johnny Carson, um, Dry Bar is kind of like Johnny Carson today, isn't it? Oh, my gosh changed my life yeah and it was funny because i worked i was on tour um october of the previous year I, I taped in january of 2019 so october i get a call from my manager you're gonna do dry bar i go what's that i had no clue what it mm -hmm. was and i was out there with brad upton uh, on tour and brad says it changed his life i go what do you mean he goes i got 100 million views and i go what never even heard of it so I tell Tammy, my wife, I'm doing dry bar. She goes, oh, my gosh, it's in my feed every day. I go, what the heck is it? I know, you know, and why again, did you tell me? No wonder, I'm, no wonder I'm such a success. I don't even know what the biggest. <laughs> Who's this you Carson? Think I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So anyway, I, I tape in January, and uh, I hired a social media guy immediately that I couldn't afford. It was mm -hmm. more than my mortgage. Mm -hmm. And we're fine, but we're yeah. broke. You know, we're, yeah. we're living okay. So I can't pay the guy, but I, f I tell my manager I'm going to hire this guy and get things in place in case my dry bar mm -hmm. connects. So I get there January, and I said, when are you going to release this? He says, six months. I go, 
<laughs> I can't pay for this guy for six months. So anyway, as as you know, God would have it. Um, two weeks later, they call and go, "This is really good. We're going to release it like in two weeks." Hmm. So uh, that's March. They release it, and every day, Tammy, I walk out. She's going. We're up to twenty million views. We're up to forty million views. We're up to seventy million views. I had called my financial guy and said, "I'm going to need money in the summer. I'm going to have to pull out of my IRA to, to get through the summer." Wow. I my calendar was empty from June to August, and by the end of April, we were turning work down. And it was like, holy cow! I'll tell you what. The, the funniest story. My manager. I, I got a, a rule. I don't work outside. That goes back to, you know, I was doing a show and they had a hot air balloon 50 mm. feet from me. <laughs> <laughs> Always good you know, for comedy. Right. And right before I'm leaving the staff, I, I, okay, I've adjusted to the hot air. <laughs> Some guy comes by in a bullhorn. The hot dogs are ready, kids. The hot dogs are ready. So, and, and my manager was with me and I said, that's it. No more outdoor. And so anyway, he calls me up and he says, I got some good news and bad news. And I said, what's the, uh, the, the bad news? He says, you're working in somebody's backyard in Long Island for their husband's uh, 65th oh my birthday. Gosh. Oh, Lenny. He goes, I said, all right, what's the good news? He goes, it's 10 grand. I go, what? He goes, she didn't even blink. I go, what? I'm there. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to give you, I'm a, coming give you my an example of the horror-like nature of my existence. You know, I learned early on in my life, right. I'm for a cause until it inconveniences me. This right. goes back yeah. to Tammy's pregnancy. Yeah. yeah. So let me, so, so let's go back. Um, you're 10 years into your stand-up. Your dad gives you first mention of your stand-up. 10 years you're doing stand-up. Yeah. You, he first says something to you. But the one thing you relate to your dad on is Cosby and comedy right. albums. Tell me about your dad. Um, hard man to get close to. Um, I think there was some severe damage done. Um, maybe at church because of his reaction to anything church really. He told me when I was 14 to stay away from Christians. His father was a pastor. His dad, uh, brother was a pastor. Here's a story. My uh, Uncle Ken, my dad's brother, um, much younger than my dad, was an accident. Um, always wanted to share the gospel with my dad, mm. right? So anyway, my father was just intimidating to everybody. So my mother's passing away from ovarian cancer, and my uncle gets called to Arizona, and he thinks God's calling him to share the gospel with my dad. Mm. So my mother goes to bed. She's tired. She's doing chemo and stuff, and she goes to bed. Now it's my dad and his brother in this front room watching TV, and it gets really quiet. And Kenny goes, you know, Jack? And my father goes, cram it, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. the, the mere mention of right. yeah, anything. Yeah. So um, he was a difficult guy. He had very talented, man. Um, Could have went to Juilliard. I was told this. Again, this is anecdotal. I kind of related to Elizabeth Warren when she said, well, that's yeah. what I was told. Right. Me too. You know? Yeah. Me too. You can only go with the family. So yeah. His sister told me, my aunt said that your father was invited to Juilliard out of the army to, to play music and he wanted to paint. My father was, a, I'd love to show you. I got a Louis Armstrong painting my father painted. That oh, was wow. when he died. I, my sister said, he didn't leave us much money. I said, you can have all the money. I just want the Louis Armstrong painting. Wow. It was a, I just bought a huge piece of art in uh, Idaho. I saw it. I had to have it. It was uh, an, one of Louis' songs. Uh -huh. um, somebody put into a big piece of metal we're going to put on the wall. I mean, uh -huh. but every time I hear uh, Louis, Louis, I think Armstrong. of my father. But uh, never painted at home. My mom said he sent paintings off to Europe, and they got destroyed. They fell in somewhere, and he burned everything. He had mm. beautiful portraits of my mother, she said. In the end of his life, he started painting again. He would go around um, Arizona and take pictures of weathered Native Americans mm. and stuff. He didn't want to buy a picture of somebody mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, paint it. He mm -hmm. wanted to, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why he was convicted on the first. He was the first road rage. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is this is again anecdote. My I I understand it. My father wanted to get a picture of a hawk. Again, he doesn't want to buy a picture of a hawk and paint it. He wanted to right. shoot a picture of right. a hawk. Couldn't get one. So one day he's at a red light, and there's a hawk on some roadkill. 
they always had his camera next to him. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, he gets out of the car, and he's, you know, and you got to know my dad. He's got arthritis. He can't move, so he's crawling on the ground. <laughs> And he's getting the f- camera, and the light turns green, and the woman behind him honks. And the hawk flies, hawk flies away. away. Well, he lays into her. I mean, you f and Bob, you know. So, oh, so anyway, she takes his license plate down. So my mother's telling me this story because Dad's in jail. <laughs> so anyway, she says the state trooper came in, and she said all he had to say was, you know, I lost, I, I, you know, I got a little out of control. And the guy would let him go. Your father had to reenact the whole thing. I mean, all the way down to, he's flanging his arms, he's cussing. They lived in a trailer park, so people were coming out of their trailer parks to look at him. <laughs> I mean, he could have been a great actor. Anyway, the guy cuffed him and hauled him away. So your, your dad, you think there was maybe some abuse, church, something? I also something. think bipolar. Okay. My dad also abused, and it uh, was fused with church. didn't happen with a pastor or anything but it was fused with the church um had the same kind of experience and my dad was abused by his father and my father told me this maybe when i turned about 50 i think and nobody knew and i'm the only one he told and uh i think in reading the book i'm i'm thinking Gosh, you're sharing some really, you know, not so great things. Right. And uh, I thought, but you know what? I know I've told my children, especially my son, about my father and his father. And now I'm the father. And he's the first generation that could be free right. of all of that. Because it's a generational thing. Well, I told both my boys on their wedding day. I sat them down and I said, I've, I've saddled you with things that you are completely unaware of. You were too young to know. But your wife will draw them out of you. You're going to act in a way as a husband or a man that you find unbecoming to who you think you are. Come talk to me. And uh, my oldest son went to Iraq. He came home. He had uh, PTSD and some TBI and... We were at our uh, granddaughter's fourth, um, she's four years old and she's doing a little dance thing. And we come out to the garage and my son is in the process of ripping the door off his um, minivan. Just had a fit and ripping. I mean, just. And his wife, what a saint. She stood by, watched the whole thing, you know. And uh he finished. I, I just, I felt, because I used to have fits like that, you know. That was one of those things. But she let him do it. Rips it off, and then he sits there. He's exhausted, embarrassed, and shamed. She walks over and says, Aaron, why don't you go down, you know, take a seat, and we'll get the door on, and we'll go home. Mm. I got in the car. I told Tammy, thank God she married him. What a... That's the way to handle it. You know, so many would get in there and go, what are you, an idiot? You know, and the mm-hmm. next thing, the second door is getting ripped off. And mm-hmm. the third door, you're smashed, you know. Um, but that was one of those moments that I said to him. I said, that's, I used to, you know, throw fits, you know, and out of nowhere, you know. I mean, I write about one in the book where I was pounding on a heavy bag. Um, I had installed a 50-pound heavy bag to hit when the rage come up, so I didn't mm-hmm. smash dishes. And mm-hmm. So I was out there pounding it one night, Tammy and I got into an argument, I just went out, and years later she told me, she goes, you know, I never said this to you, but when you hit that bag, I thought you were hitting me. Wow. Yeah, can you imagine? I, I said, God, no. Baby, I was just hitting, just hitting, this bile, you know. So I'm pounding, it falls off, and I'm picking it up, and I'm throwing it against the cinder block fence, just exhausted, screaming at the heavens. Why? You know, why? I mean, I, I, again, just, it's as if, you know. Where'd it come from? I, I, you, know, I, you know, my father, um, the men in her family were, you know, and that's when, when we were, you know, we're backing up out of the story, out of the sequence, but we, we had filled out divorce papers and we're filing them. And uh, 10 minutes from the courthouse, Tammy changed her mind and said, let's pull over. And she says, let's go home. I said, you're out. 
She said, what do you mean? I said, Tammy, I love you, but I'm damaged goods. I don't know if I'm ever going to change. You know, and it, you know, I'd go long stretches without, but eventually mm-hmm. I would snap and smash things. And, you know, she grew up in a home where if someone lost their temper, she got hit. Mm. See, the therapist told me that. She goes, every time you raise your voice, it triggers all that stuff in your wife, and she just cowers, mm. you know? So, I, you know, but I told her I'm damaged, you know? She said, let's go home. I said, we go home, divorce is off the table. You know what you got now, you know? When we got married, we didn't know each other. You know, it was just two broken people that um, God put together, you know, and uh, tried to figure all of that out. I never had a relationship over a week until I got married. Let me go back to your dad for a second, then we're going to jump to your marriage. Um, your brother won, I think it was a Little League championship. I did. You did. That was mine. You. Yeah. Okay. And dad came in. Yeah, it was funny. My father, because I was, I was a pretty good athlete. I was actually really good. And my father told me years later, he goes, you know, I didn't want, I, I was proud of you, but I didn't want to tell you that because I didn't want you to get a big head. <laughs> and I said, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no esteem at all. Thank you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, when he told me I was a good comic, uh, I crawled into, I was 30 some years old. He says, you, you're really a good comic. And I crawled in and told Tammy, I said, well, I got it. She goes, what, approval from the old man? She goes, are you whole now? I go, nah. No. <laughs> it's about 33 years too yeah. late. <laughs> you know? So, but your dad yeah. came in. Right. And told you, God doesn't exist. Right. And he <laughs> chose the highest, I know, it's <laughs> at the highest point of my young life, the proudest moment of my life. I was, I won MVP at an all-star baseball tournament. I was sitting there with the trophy and he said, uh, you're going to, if you travel, you know, every, we talked about playing professional sports, mm-hmm. you know, so if you'd manage to defeat all the odds and become a professional, someone's going to come to you and tell you that that talent you have is God given. And you, this is what you tell them. Kiss your ass. There is no God. And then he went in to just telling me, you know, his views on metaphysics and, and uh, Christians are the worst. I can just... You know, there's there's a thing. I was talking to somebody whose parent is getting old, and they're like, you know, before I go, I should tell you. And you're like, no, don't tell me that. I don't want to know that. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's yeah. some things. Just tell me you love me. Yeah, things that parents do that you're like, there's right. no reason to yeah. tell me that. Yeah, no, the worst no. thing a parent when they tell you it's you know for your own good. I did that for you. You know, yeah. You. I didn't want you to get a big head. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. More with Jeff in just a minute. There's nothing worse than having odors in your home that just will not go away. I have teenagers. My son, yes, he just moved out to go to college, but his room still has a nice odor to it. You can't, I mean, I don't know what it is. You can't get rid of it um, unless you use something called Eden Pure Thunderstorm Air Purifier. Now, this is different than lighting a candle, light a match, uh, or, uh, you know, putting some sort of sent into the house this is actually a system that kills the odor from cigarettes from things that are in your refrigerator whatever it starts working in seconds and it clears the room of smells you don't have to replace a filter it has already sold over 350,000 thunderstorm units so far Um, they have thousands of five-star reviews online mine's one of them they this is fantastic This week, they're running a special that you're not going to want to miss. Here's what you have to do. You go save $200 on three thunderstorms for the whole home protection. I have three units, and I have it in the bedroom, in the kitchen, and uh, at the end of the uh, the house with the hallway. So you cover the whole house. EdenPureDeals.com. Enter the discount code GLEN. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Discount code GLEN. Um, okay, so now you meet Tammy. You're how old? 29. You're 30, 29. 30. 30. Yeah. So you're... S- 29. You're still yeah. thinking of the silo of cocaine? Oh, I'm, I'm using. Yeah, okay. you know, yeah, yeah, but I, you know... Mm-hmm. Um, but you're Yeah, cool. I'm headlining yeah. clubs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've been at it for seven, eight years now. Okay. And um, going and- to a club, and I do this in the, you know... I fell in love with her laugh. 
smoker, you know, 37 <laughs> years ago, you know, all that gagging, gasping, wheezing <laughs> right. that annoys the general population right. when you hear yeah. that as a comic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, you love you know, it. Yeah. yeah. So I heard this symphony of joy coming from the back of the room. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I run back after you the show. You make her sound so beautiful. I and she is. She is. She's gorgeous. She is beautiful. Yeah. Why do you just make her? <laughs> so anyway, I run back off this because I'm, you know, I got to meet her. I mean, she, obviously she digs me because she's laughing yeah. so hard. And anyway, she she's gone. I go, did she die? I mean, did they haul her away? They go, she was changing clothes. She walks out, just short leather skirt, white blouse and perms, you know, mm-hmm. 80s. Just that was it. You know, it was funny. Years later, my son goes, so, you know, you and mom. I said, yeah, I met her at a club. I followed her around two days before she even noticed me. He goes, so you stalked her. I go, that would be today's terms. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> That'd be what they call it today. Yeah, Back right, then, right. it's only if you were creepy, and I, I, I hadn't hit the creep stage yet. So, um, so single mom, she had a two-year-old, okay, and I'm working two jobs. So that impressed me because I could barely do one. <laughs> right. <laughs> and did you like kids? No. Yeah. No, I told her, and it, it's you know she it's it's interesting. Uh, she read the, the final draft. I told her you got to read the. And be okay with my version of what we went through. And she read like the first two chapters and put it down and said, we were horrible people. And she's, she worries because the few interviews she'd done, they really look at her and go, why'd you stay with them? You know, I mean, it's a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. So security, that's one of her answers. Uh, I wouldn't answer for her. I don't want to answer for her. But um, I told her at one point, keep them away from me. I don't like kids. Oh, my gosh. You know. And like she said, she goes, the woman I am today wouldn't even step foot in a room with you, who you were. And I go, I don't know if I'd date you, the man I am today. I certainly wouldn't date a smoker. I mean, that, you know, after putting up with that for... <laughs> <laughs> she used to light up in bed. Right. She used to light up in bed at two a.m. You know, right. th- does this bother you? No, I've like I've always slept in pool halls. This this is great. <laughs> you know? She's cowering in the corner because you're breaking stuff, and you're like, and yeah. smoking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite was when she quit. I, I used to see junkies coming off of heroin in better shape. So I walk in one day. She's like two days without a cigarette, and she's frantically running around. I mean, and screaming at me. <laughs> and I said, uh, what is your problem? She, she says, I can't find the keys. And she's waving them at me. I can't <laughs> find my keys. And I said, they're in your hand. And she looks, and she had hard candy that she would suck on, right? Uh, and I said, if you're waiting for me, the drug addict, to tell you to go have a pack of cigarettes <laughs> because you're having a bad day, <laughs> she throws the whole hard pack, <laughs> goes up the flying J, comes back going, I'm okay now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? So I never thought she'd quit, but those grandkids, uh, granddaughter, or the daughter in laws, said that they would not bring the kids by if she was smoking. That will change things. It did Am- immensely. Things. She started yeah. vaping, and then now she's she's. And off cigarettes for quite so a you while. were at the airport when you <laughs> well that was yeah yeah I, when you I, asked her to marry you. i met her in november january I, I was living in la she was in ohio i flew her and a two-year-old out to la uh played dad for a week took the kid to the beach and disneyland or something in april i'm flying on a red eye somewhere maybe over nebraska maybe my sixth or seventh cocktail i decide i'm gonna ask her to marry me you know no ring no plane you know again no plan. <laughs> and I always tell audiences, if there's a young man within the sound of my voice, I don't recommend this. I mean, yeah, right. If you want to do something on impulse, buy a yeah. pair of shoes. <laughs> you know? So I'm at baggage claim, and I just say, I love you. I love Aaron. You want to get married? And she says, pardon me? I said, do you want to get married? You and I. So she knew who I was talking about. <laughs> right. and, she thought, and the bags are coming down right. on the belt. Right, we're just right. collecting luggage. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. Uh, Very romantic. She, yes, and then she waits, and she finally looks at me, and this is a direct quote. Yeah, I guess if that's what you want. <laughs> it was like I said, hey, you want to go to McDonald's for right. breakfast? Yeah, if that's what you want. It was no different. Well, I mean, no different. you're at the, you're right. at the baggage claim. Right. I mean, that's kind of the response yeah. you would expect. Well, I, you know, I always say I, I pay the price for that because every movie we watch where a guy does it right, she cries and sobs. And I go, I'll ask you again, all right, please. <laughs> and she says, no, my story's baggage claim. <laughs> that's what I got for a story. Thanks. I did ask her to marry me again in Israel. We went out to uh, Israel with Huckabee. And mm-hmm. um, I told Mike, I said, uh, 
distract my wife. I'm going to buy her a ring at one of the merchants mm-hmm. there. And I bought a ring. And it was so funny because I was so nervous asking her to marry me again. We were married 33 years. And I'm up there shaking. Yeah. And she, you hear her whisper on the tape, get on one knee. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I forgot. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to correct one of the wrongs, you know, that I could. So anyway, uh, did she say yes? Yeah, she did actually. Boy, I, which, yeah, there was she had it. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, no. a slight hesitation. You know. uh, it's it's strange because I did something similar when we were in England recently, and I had the same kind of nerves. Yeah, I had the yeah. butterflies and the nerves, and I'm like, Isn't that great? she ain't going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. But it's just it's yeah, it's neat. It's neat when you find it. Um, so when you're performing, you're drinking, you're drugging, you're empty inside. I oh, think yeah. those were your exact words. Yeah, the classic story I write about in the book is I was sitting on a stool in a hockey rink because everybody was doing comedy in the 80s. Mm. So I'm sitting in this hockey rink and uh, can't even get a word out. And I finally just go, why are we here? What's the point? Dead silent. I mean, 500 people in this rink. Can hear a pin drop. And out of the back of the room, some little squeaky woman goes, we just want to hear some jokes. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't that great? And I go, that that is legit. (laughs) And I ended up doing my show and and finishing. But it was like, that was where I was at. Uh, Agents would call my managers at the time and, and just go, what's the problem with him, man? But it was like, I just didn't know what the point to all of it was. That's all. I mean, I used to tell people, that you, I don't know if you know what it's like to wake up every day of your life with just absolutely no idea of what you want to do with your life. You know, I was going through the motions. I mean, I had a, I had a skill set. I had one. You know, I can do comedy. But when that ran out, you know, the, the, the uh, veneer ran off of that pretty quick in the 90s when all of a sudden, you know, you're babysitting drunks. Mm. You know, the, the money was going down. I could barely pay the bills, you know. And, uh, yeah, I, I tried to. It was very funny. I tried to uh, do temp work. And um, they call me and say, it says here you're a comedian. And I said, I am. And they said, well, would you like to see people for this particular comedian at the theater? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Listen. So, anyway, I'm not going to give you the name of the guy. But Tammy heard it. You're not seating people for that hack. You're a comic. Fire your agent. My God, I'm sick of this. She's like shaking me. She's just, this is what you do. You're good at what you do. Just be that. You know, and uh, anyway, I fired my agent. He said, she, she was right. She, he's got you convinced. I hired my father for an agent. I mean, basically mm. had me convinced that I was lucky enough to be uh, making, you know. It's th- amazing what the, what people you know, Sinatra said, just get a kick out of stomping on a dream. Yeah. And it's amazing the damage those people can do to somebody. Well, I had a club owner. I was a year and a half into it. And he goes, you'll never make a living at this. You know? <laughs> and I said, thank you. He goes, you're welcome. I said, no, anybody who's ever made anything of their life has had some a-hole in the course of their life. Tell them they're not going to make anything of your life. You're mm-hmm. my a-hole. And I'm mm-hmm. still telling the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have that same guy. Yeah. Um, so when did you sober up during this period? What uh, year was it? Well, it was, um, I got sober at 25 briefly. I was still doing cocaine. So technically, I'm, you know, <laughs> you know it's his desire to quit it's drinking. Alcohol is <laughs> synonymous. All right. <laughs> right exactly. His is cocaine. Completely yeah. different. I'm sitting in meetings, you know, <laughs> going to the bathroom and coming out. You know, so it didn't last long. Let's just right. put it that way. But I knew if I went back, I'd stay. And um, the story I write in the book, um, which is, uh, we had a discussion over whether or not I should print this, you know, but it's already out on the Internet. I spanked my six month old son. Um, I had, no, no, no. Tell the whole story. OK. OK. And I, I, All right. I want to preface this. I know you and um, the reason why I, I wanted to do this interview with you is because there are so many dark things that all of us do one way or another. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people who will listen to this and go, Ooh, I've been there or I am there. Right. And the reason why I wanted to do this interview is because you are not this man anymore. No, 
you're not this man. No. Well, I had come home. I was, we were living in Boston, and I had come home, and um, as I had been, you know, it was like one or two in the morning, and I'm sitting in my makeshift office drinking some rum and doing some cocaine, trying to figure out why I am so miserable, where all of this guilt came from. I never had guilt. I mean, I, you know, got arrested, you know, part of being a drunk. Mm -hmm. You get arrested, Mm -hmm. you know, all this, this stuff. So never had guilt about it, you know. It was annoying and it bothered me, but it, it was never this deep-seated guilt. And I realize it's probably started when I got married. We're not even a year married now. And I, I come to the conclusion that it's the marriage. So I need to get out of this marriage. And I don't do conflict well. I just don't. Growing up, conflict, you know, if I stood up for myself, I got pitched against the wall. So when we start conflict as a man and wife, my fight or flights kicks in. Hers has to, too. Well, she is, she, hers is, she Power was back. beat. Yes. So she pushes to stop it. And, and oh, this is what the okay. therapist told me. Because I said, why does she keep pushing me when I tell her, just give me five minutes? She, she has to stop it. She doesn't understand it's counterproductive to keep pushing, mm-hmm. you know. So anyway, she's sleeping. It's two in the morning. The kids are asleep. And I decide that if I beat her up, she'd leave you. She'll leave me. And I'm out. I can just send money. So anyway, I work, you know, drinks and whatever. And I, you know, part of me is like, obviously, this is crazy. But then the other part's going, I got to, I got to. So anyway, I walk in, I finally. Mm, isn't it amazing? I hate to use the word courage. I, I worked up the courage to yeah. do this. I mean, it's not. So anyway, I walk <laughs> in and I'm standing over her, and that voice that, we all have. C.S. Lewis said it in Mere Christianity. I mean, you can deny, but we have a conscience, mm-hmm. all of us. We know right or wrong. So I'm wrestling with that. And then my son starts crying. He's six months old. And um, I got to go in and quiet him. And then he's not quieting. And I, again, start spanking him. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Mm. She wakes up. She comes in. She grabs him from me. And she says, who does this? Mm. And then she walks in and sits on the edge of the bed and feeds him. And while he was getting fed, I realized what I had done. I mean, the shame that washed over me. I mean, it was like humiliating. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then to think what I could have done. Right. So I walked in and told her, if you don't take me to Alcoholics Anonymous, I won't go. And if I don't go, I don't think we're going to make it. Not even thinking. You know, she already had one child from another guy. And we're not even a year into this one. She's got another child. And here's her husband going, I don't think we're going to make it. Oh, my God. I told a friend months later, I, he had a small child, and I, he was an alcoholic. And I said, you're going to come home one night and look at that kid. And you're going to do one of two things. You're going to run for the hills, or you're going to get the help you need. And he was in Massachusetts, and I found out he was living in San Francisco. The ocean stopped him. Mm. I'm glad I stuck, you know. But she took me, and then they said, pray. I said, the what? And then it started the whole thing And when you first me. started... You were, tr- you, I mean, you're working in a comedy business. Yeah. You're at bars. Right. Well, I said, if you, if, if you like to sleep, get a job at a mattress factory. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know? so. so you're at bars, but you're now trying to stop drinking. Somebody right. thinks they're doing you a favor at one point. Uh, pours vodka in your orange juice, right? Without right. you knowing Thinking, it. Yeah. And then I spit it across the bar. And then I go to a meeting and go, and then I lose my sobriety. Because all of a sudden... I don't know when I quit. You know, I count the years now. I don't count mm-hmm. the days. But it's like you go, I don't, but anyway, and some guy goes, what are you doing in a bar? And I said, I make my living. I'm a comedian. And he goes, well, you're going to have to quit your job. And I said, I didn't come here for career advice. <laughs> I came here to try to learn to live in a world that has alcohol in it. And if you can't help me, I can save myself six, seven hours a week by not coming in here, you know. And um, my sponsor gave me the greatest, he said the greatest thing to me mm-hmm. because of my ego and my pride. I, I was complaining that I couldn't drink like all the other drunks. And he said, whoa, 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 back up. Who says you can't drink? You're a big boy. Nobody's going to stop you. But think it through, man. You know, it's going to cost you. And I'm not talking about the f- five or six dollars for the drink. You lose your wife, your kids, all this stuff. So um, why don't you just say you choose not to drink today? So then it became like, 
I choose not to do right. it. Right. It's my pride. I, right. you know, I could. Yeah. I, I could. could if I wanted to. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to. I see those. You know. So anyway, it, it was really good for me to hear that. I could. And that was the way I phrased it. People go, um, you want a drink? I go, nah, not today. You mm-hmm. know, I might tomorrow, but not today. Back with Jeff Allen in just a second. First, uh, let me tell you, since the early days of Blaze TV, we have been fortunate enough to work with the team at Relief Factor. Um, they brought this anti-inflammatory to the marketplace. They had tested it in their hometown of Seattle, and it showed remarkable ability to reduce pain for many different types of chronic ailments. At the time they were introduced, I was in uh, terrible pain. Um, I didn't use it because I thought it was like ibuprofen, and ibuprofen never works for me, ever. My wife, finally, about two years in, said, why don't you try this? And I said, because it's not going to work, ibuprofen. This isn't ibuprofen. This, the, ibuprofen attacks your inflammation one direction. This comes from four different directions, and it works for me. And 70% of the people who try it go on to order more month after month. So just try this. doesn't work for everybody. But maybe you're part of that 70%. 1995, the quick start program from Relief Factor. Go to relieffactor.com or order 800, the number four relief. 800, the number four relief, relieffactor.com. But you were still having problems at home. Oh, God. Yeah. Whatever I drank to cover up came off in the form of rage. You know, my father, the worst and most violent he ever was is when he quit drinking for two years. Mm. My dad had rules. Self. Uh, uh, rules. If you, if, if you went to work and fed your family, you can do whatever you want mm. as a man. So anyway, he missed work one day because he couldn't get out of bed because he was hungover. And he quit drinking for two years. And, uh, man, he smashed, broke, you know. But I, I laugh. It's funny. I had a therapist tell me, every time you tell me something about your dad, you laugh about it. But, well, that's the way I grew up. I mean, yeah. you know. So anyway, he you have to a spare it's a- tire. Uh, he couldn't get the lug nuts off, so he just broke all four or five. Oh, my God. snapped them. And then he tosses the tire up the street, <laughs> cussing all the way up. People coming out of their homes. Oh, it's just Jack. <laughs> <laughs> all the way up the street, down the street, you know. And, um, you know, as a kid, it's, you know, it's, it's your dad. It's kind of embarrassing. I was never home, you know. I just got to a point where I never, if his car was in the driveway, I'd turn around and go back to a friend's house. So at this time, you have another fight, and this one really turns you around. With Tammy, you have another fight where you fly across the room and. Well, that was upstairs. Yeah, the um, um, we were in the middle of an argument, and this is now I'm in therapy. And I I don't know if you did therapy. I did. But, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But so you have mind. to once you cover, once you uncover, then you're just left with this thing, and you're so afraid to look in it. Right. So and, afraid. But to also, look in it. it's like, oh wow. That's yeah. true. When you get a therapist. Well, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, uh, we, we're in the middle of an argument, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she throws a toy at me and hits me in the head. And I fly across. I get her by the... It's the only time I've ever laid my hands on her. And I went like that. And I just pulled back. And she started pummeling me. Just pummeling me. And I let her. I just... Oh, my God. So now we sit down. And mm-hmm. it gets quiet. My youngest boy walks over. And he says... Uh, Look, Daddy. He pulls a book out. Look, Daddy. He's trying to get me to laugh. Doing and I read, read and I read Bradshaw's book on family mm-hmm. dynamics. The youngest is the comedian, the good mm-hmm. nature. So anyway, I said, that's our comedian. Tammy goes, what are you talking about? And then a lamp goes down in the living room. Smash. And I said, Aaron did that on purpose. She goes, why would he do that? So we'd stop fighting. I said, today it's a lamp. Tomorrow it's drug addiction. It's liquor store it's whatever they're going to get your attention if we don't take care of us these kids are going to be destroyed she says you're crazy i said i'm telling you tammy everything we're doing we were programmed to do Mm -hmm. we just got to break the program that's hard oh my god well that was it i I don't know if i can do it because we're sitting but i had a therapist tell me you can't hit anything anymore you can't punch walls you can't so i can I go, what do I do with my hands when I feel like doing it? She goes, put them in your pocket. So Tammy and I are in the middle of an argument. I don't want to think that we argued every, you know. But, yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, these are highlights. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> lowlights. Lowlights. Yeah. Right. So anyway, I'm in the living room with my hands in my pockets, and I'm shaking. <laughs> Tammy finally goes, 
what is with you? <laughs> you know, I go, I just want to punch something. You know, she goes, my God, what is wrong? Said, but she can't get it. I mean, they don't understand. I mean, anybody who's, unless you've suffered from that kind of anger where something clicks, you're not there anymore. You're not there. And it has to run its course. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, I have to, you know, and for me, it's shame. When shame kicks, then you humiliate, and then, it, then, it, then I'm gone. I am gone. So I got to catch it before I, I do something that makes me ashamed of myself. Whether I raise my voice and yell or say something, if, as long as I don't do that, I'm fine. But when it kicks in and that computer goes, it's like, wow. I mean, it, it, again, I'm not, I can't, but you can't excuse it. You know, I, you know, I'd walk back in and go, she'd go, I know you're sorry. I am. I don't have anything else for you. I don't know why I do this, you know? I mean, that's why I'm in the backyard throwing a 50-pound bag around yelling at the heavens. Why? So, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> so what did you learn in therapy? I learned that um, we are, as children, anger is the cover emotion for sadness. We're usually deeply saddened as children. And it comes to a point where whatever age you are, you know, you're sad, 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 sad. And then one day you go, I'm not going to feel this anymore. Mm -hmm. So every time sadness kicks, you cover it with the anger. That's what I learned. And the computer starts at a very young age mm -hmm. um, with, with, with that. And it's, uh, children can't verbalize their feelings, mm -hmm. so they act them out. You know, I, I always tell this story because to me, we had a, Aaron bit, my youngest, my oldest bit. He didn't know how to, we always go, use your words. He'd start to take a hunk out of his brother. Use your words. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so anyway, you go to family or uh, to school functions and the whispers would start. And I said, That's a kid who took a hunk out of my daughter. You know, it's like their parents, <laughs> they think you discipline that way. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they look mm -hmm. at you as going, right. well, you're biting your kids. You know, right. get over here. <laughs> 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 No, we're not. You want to yeah. stand up and think, no, we're right. not. We don't, we don't condone this. But he just didn't know how to, to process. Uh, here's, here's a story. I don't know if I put this in the book or not, about the, uh, Iraq, uh, the first Iraq war. Aaron gets in a fight at school, and um, I get a call from Tammy. Aaron got in a fight, and I, that isn't my son. So I get him on the phone. I said, Aaron, what's going on? He goes, nothing, Dad. I, and, and it took me five minutes to get it out of him. You fly in the sky, there's bombs in the sky, you're going to get blown up and killed and not come home. Mm. Holy cow. And I said, we have a Mr. Duke down the street, trains pilots over at Litchfield for the Air Force. I said, you go talk to him and I'll call you tomorrow. So I call him the next day. I go, did you talk to Mr. Duke? He goes, yeah, he says we're kicking ass. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. But that's the difference between at least understanding that, yeah. I mean, if my father would have just said, bam, don't do that, you know? I don't think, you know, we've, um, I, I think we've overcorrected. But in our generation, it was, shut up, sit down, just do it. Right. Stop your whining, yeah. just do it. I heard a quote from a Japanese businessman. They said, what would your father say if you told him he loved you, you loved him? He said, I'd been in America too long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... So <clears throat> what does the phrase um, you win mean to you? Daddy, you win. I got into an argument. <laughs> it sounds like that's all we did for. But no, I, but the good part's coming now. Right. We get into the argument in, the, in Jersey and um, I end up, uh, uh, I, what I didn't put, I don't think I put in, did I put it about the cheese? It was over a chunk of cheese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, again, when it clicks, you're off, and it, it, there's no logic. Mm -hmm. So I go to open up a piece of cheese, and I see it's been sitting. I got a phobia of deary. I mean, <laughs> I, I've been going to comedy condos for years. I've been sick two or right. three times on mayo, and you know how yeah. long mayo has to sit before it goes bad? <laughs> a you know, long I mean, time. A long time. Yeah. Long time. So anyway, I see something. And if I don't know how long it's been there, I don't eat it. So I open up the new package, and I throw out the, the hunk. And Tammy says, comes in and sees me. She goes, there's another pack. I said, yeah, I saw that. I don't want it. And then it starts. What do you mean you don't want it? I, I, I don't want it. You know? And so I end up, three minutes later, on a stool, yelling at her at the top of my lungs, I don't want it. Are you effing deaf? I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Over and over and over again. And she finally falls on her knees and sobs and 
now I feel like, you know, the jerk that I am. And I go put my son to bed. Um, and he's six or seven. I don't know. And he says, Daddy, you win. I go, what do you mean I win? He goes, you yell, Mommy cries, you win. Oh, my gosh. And I went downstairs and told Tammy, I'm going to get help. That's when I got into therapy. I said, uh, I, I didn't want to be this way. That's the thing. It, it's hard. You know, it's, it, it, it's so simplistic to say change. Okay. I, you know, I had an ideal of what I wanted to be, but then there's this computer inside me. Yeah. You know? The tapes that well, run over and over and over. That's and it. Over. The reaction to things and... and I, I'm telling you, if it's true what they say, that alcoholics remain emotionally where they were when they started drinking, then it all makes sense to me because yeah. I behave like a 13-year-old. Yeah. That's exactly how I behaved. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you think about it. Standing I'd on the chair. Stomping my feet. I don't want When it. I didn't get my way. Yeah. You know, and um, again, not even really caring about the. The, the responsibility so of the, you're this kid chicago dad uh could have been somebody great uh wasn't uh, atheist angry inside you want to change you you don't and then this moment happens when did you really change that night i pitched the 50 pound bag i stood in the yard exhausted and I look up and my wife and kids are standing at the back door and I'm telling you I'm sweating I'm exhausted and I walk in and my five-year-old Ryan comes over and he goes daddy you scare me and Mm. I picked him up and I held him and I said I scare myself son and uh, something washed over me I believe in my heart as a Christian that was when the night the Holy Spirit said I'm I'm coming Mm. I believe this. I wasn't aware of it. I had no idea. But I looked at Tammy, and for the first time I said to her, this will never happen again. And you knew it to be true. I did. I, she goes, bullshit. And I said, have I ever said that to you? She goes, what difference does that make? I said, my father said it to my mother over and over and over again. My brother said it to his wife over Always happened. I always knew it would happen. So I, didn't wanna, I don't want to make promises I can't keep, knowingly can't keep. Sometimes you make promises and then you some things happen but i don't know how i know this i don't know how i know this but I, I'm, I'm okay she says get out of here you know you live in hotels anyway just get out and i go babe I'm, I'm telling you i'm okay you know and um uh i believe that that set me up for when i found out about the guy she was seeing in california for that one night. And what happened there? Um, I get the, you kind of know something's going on. Phone mm-hmm. calls are taken in the kitchen, moved mm-hmm. to the bedroom, and you know, so you get this feeling, you know, that something's she's right. seeing something. So anyway, she goes to California to visit a friend, and I just really got a gut feeling so i call american express i call, first of all i call her friend and she says well she's out shopping so you're like who goes visit a friend and then, and then go shopping mm-hmm. so i call american express and i go is my card being used and they said uh, yeah it's at a hotel in southern california or something anyway so i said can i have the number of the hotel she said yeah so I, anyway she calls she picks up i said gotcha get home mm. anyway long silence she said okay and then uh Two hours later, her friend called me and said, Tammy's too devastated to come home right now. She'll be home in the morning. And I believe this, Glenn. Had she come home that night, we wouldn't be married today. You know, James, in the book of James, he talks about the human tongue, and he compares it to oh, a, yeah. a rudder on a ship. It's a small part of a very large vessel, but you can't steer that ship without that piece. And the tongue is the same thing. It's a small part of our body, but you steer this whole thing with the tongue. And God gave me the ability. It's the most dangerous thing. Gave me the ability to bless and curse. Yeah. And I would have cut her. I, I know I would have. I was righteously angry for the first time. You know, it's like yeah. tell an angry guy that now you can, you can be angry. Everybody understands. That's yeah. why, you know, I, I don't know if I wrote about much of this in the book, but it's politics for me in the 90s. 
when you're angry, politics is wonderful because people ask why you're so angry. They look at your beautiful wife, they look at your healthy children, they look at the job you do, and they go, why are you so ticked off? Them. Yeah. Them. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Republicans, the Democrats, the whatevers, you know. So I had a night alone, and every time I'd get righteously angry, that little voice inside of me that I believe now is the Holy Spirit says to me, remember the time in New Jersey when you stood on a stool? Mm. And there were dozens of those. Remember the time you threw the, you know, remember this, remember that, you know. And I mean, but I go, yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, it's like there's another voice in me going, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, but yeah, but she's doing, you know, exhausted. I went from how could she to how could she not by the end of the night. I mm. just, yeah, I picked her up at the airport the next day and she walks out. She's tear streaked and just exhausted. I'm exhausted. Put my arms around her, gave her a kiss on the cheek. And uh, she says, that's it. I go, that's all I got left. We're a mess. You and me. What you want is in California, I'm not going to stand in your way. If you want this to work, then you take 50% of the blame for this mess. I'll take the other 50. If it gets 51-49, the resentments will kill us. We'll start mm -hmm. blaming each other. You take your mess, I'll take mine, and we'll see what we can work out. And then going home, she says, how did we get here? And that's, you know, hope you hope the answer in the book. Uh, we got there, you know, we, we walked into it. It was really explained to me pretty cool that when two broken people get married, you know, my neuroses are maybe round holes. Her mm -hmm. neuroses are round pegs. Mm -hmm. We fit. We have a little mm -hmm. dance that we do. And then mm -hmm. somebody gets into recovery and all of a sudden isn't reacting certain ways and stuff. Then his, his holes get a little oval. Mm -hmm. So the pegs just don't. And there's this constant mm -hmm. friction until you both get on the same page of healing, you know. And we made it, you know. Um, you know, uh, about a year and a half later, I met a guy who put the Bible in my hands, you know, and um, Ecclesiastes. I know. I know. And not like a happy part. Of it. No. Yeah. No, I, but that was my conclusions. I, I wrote about the, I, the, the, the gerbil mm -hmm. and, the, and the thing. I was kind of sitting there. <laughs> it's funny when you, but it's, it was so profound to me. Mm -hmm. Sitting there watching a the gerbil go back and forth, you know, and Tammy goes, what's with you with <laughs> And the gerbil. Because I'm looking at it like TV. I was mm. just, for like 20 minutes, I'm just mm -hmm. sitting there watching this thing. And I said, look, it gets sticks over here, and then he moves them over here, and you know." And she goes, so what? And I go, yeah, but wait. He moves them back over there and stacks them up and spins a wheel every now and then when he wants to entertain himself. She goes, so what? I go, it's our life. She goes, what do you mean? I go, I'm projecting 10, 15, 20 years from now. I mean, we get sticks. They wear out. We take them to the landfill. If I'm lucky, I get a sitcom deal, a movie deal. We get nice sticks, but they all wind up <laughs> going to the land. We're just chasing sticks, yeah. stacking them up somewhere. Then we go to Vegas, we take the kids to Disney World, and that's our wheel. And she goes, my God, Jeff, what is going on? I said, Tammy, if that's my life for the next 15, 20 years, I'm checking out. She goes, you checked out years ago. You're not even here now. Half the time when I'm talking to you, your head is off somewhere. You know? And she's, she was right. I mean, there were times we would be making love. And I'd look at her, she'd be like this. You know? <laughs> and I'd go, what? She goes, I just require you to be here. You know? Oh. Where are you at? You're not even here. You know? And you're like, wow, because my brain, well, you know, you got mm -hmm. an active brain. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's like it never stops. But it's hard. It's very hard. It's hard. It's but, very hard. But when you realize how important it is to for someone to hear you, that was a big breakthrough for me was I need to hear her and I have to concentrate. I think most guys do. Some of us are hard. I mean, it is the hardest thing for me to sit and listen and say nothing. I just had my, my, my youngest daughter. She came to me and she said, mom doesn't understand me. I never understand her, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, she comes on the couch, and she, I said, just sit down. What's happening? And she just went, and I had to bite my tongue the whole time. Right. Just, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then repeat back to her what she said. I said nothing, right. nothing. I didn't give her any advice or something. She's like, Dad, I always just feel so much better when I talk to you. And I'm like, <laughs> that's right. Right, that's right. And remember that. Remember that, right. <laughs> it's just listening and yeah. guys aren't good at that 
We're just not good at that. Is it a man thing? Uh, maybe. I, don't I think know. it is. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But I, um, I, I've, I've, I've had a word. Here's a funny story. You'll appreciate this because you're in recovery. So we got in a, a we were at a restaurant. This is a couple years ago, a few years ago. We were at a restaurant. And she's on her phone the whole time while mm. I'm eating. So I'm done. And she's a bike phone. Anyway, I'm watching the whole thing. Not talking to me. When I, you know. The last bite goes in her mouth. I go, are we done? <laughs> she throws the fork down. She goes, yeah. She gets up and she walks. <laughs> so I got to pay the bill. I'm out the all the way home, quiet. I call my sponsor. And I said, what are we doing? You know, just eating. He goes, here's what you're going to have to do. You eat fast, don't you? I go, yeah, I eat fast. I, I, I eat. I'm there to eat. I want to eat. Same way. So anyway, he says, from tonight, what are you having for dinner? I said, we're going to have steak for dinner tonight. He goes, when she bites, you bite. You don't bite until she bites. And you don't tell her what you're doing. You're kidding me. Glenn, this is the most arduous, painstaking steak I've ever eaten in my whole I know. life. And I finally told her afterwards, I said, my sponsor told me to eat. I said, how do you survive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. I, I've got all my children around the table, and they're all, I mean, because I get antsy. After yeah. I finish, I'm like, yeah. I'm just climbing the walls, you know. Right. I love, can we go someplace and do something and talk? Hey, let's go into the living room. Finish your food. <laughs> but you do it. I know. I'm like. I know. I'm a, you know okay. I know. I yeah. know. I know. So. Sometimes it seems like there's a running battle between cyber criminals and the government to see who can steal the most money from the largest number of people. And sure, the government wins most of the time, but the competition is fierce. Take home title theft, for instance. It is one of the fastest growing crimes in America right now, and there's very good reason for it. And it turns out that it's... Uh, because it's simple. Most victims of home title theft don't even know they're a victim until it's way, way too late. There was a uh, homeowner that uh, had her home stolen from her. She didn't know. She pulls into her street and she sees a bulldozer demolishing her home. There it was being torn down right before her eyes. She was the victim of a devastating crime called home title theft. Criminal had already forged her way uh, or his way onto her deed to her home sold the home now the new owner was tearing it down to rebuild your home your property your equity your most valuable assets and home title lock protects them home title lock puts a shield around your home's title the instant they detect activity or tampering they help shut it down so i want you to go to hometitlelock.com right now use the promo code beck hometitlelock.com so um are you there yet? No, you, you know what it is? I, I, I asked five questions that I had to answer, I, I, I think, you know. Um, what defines you? You know, and usually when you ask a man what defines you, the first thing they say is, I, I'm a whatever the job yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Defines me as my relationship with Christ. I'm a child of God. That first and foremost, if I get that right. Then I'm a husband to Tammy. I'm a father to Aaron and Ryan. I'm a grandfather to them. And then I'm a comedian. And if I keep those things in the right order, order because they'll switch. All of a sudden, I'm working six days a week, and I'm a comedian. I'm not much of a husband to her. you know. And I did tell my managers when this dry bar thing hit, I said, she will determine how much I work. Mm -hmm. you know. And last year, I was doing a movie, and I was on location for two weeks. And uh, we got into a little tizzy on the phone. And I said, what is going on with you? And she says, don't get mad at, don't, don't hate me for missing you. And I go, oh my God, mm. it's a country lyric. It's a hit. It's a hit. Don't hate me for me. But I called Lenny, my manager, and I said, uh, stop booking. That was September. He goes, I'm way ahead of you, man. I stopped in August. You know? it's, it's interesting. My staff has always been this way with my wife and I, and it used to be really, really bad. Um, I couldn't go away for more than a day. And, and it, 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 I just, I couldn't be without her. She didn't want yeah. to be without me. And it's still the same way. We toss and turn in bed at night if we're not laying next to each other. And uh, Well, Tammy's used to it. And I, it's interesting. I tell people a lot of marriages couldn't live the life we live because I'm gone so much. Yeah. You know, I remember. In I was, your case, that might be a plus. Well, it, well I think it <laughs> kind of saved us early. That's for sure. But um, 
there was a, I had an issue with porn years ago. And um, I told Tammy, you need to put a, uh, uh, a, 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 a device on my phone. You need to track my phone. She goes, I will not be married to a man I can't trust. Fix it. Mm. So I got the help I needed, you know, but it was like, you know, just one more thing, you know, mm. <laughs> it's like, I just, again, are we there? I mean, am I done? Mm -hmm. Am I done? My favorite story, I was doing a show for uh, a ministry that was for um, uh, secular journalists. These were some hardcore, but it was a ministry. And they got them together in Nashville. And the uh, lady who uh, was in charge of it calls me, says, we just want some comedy. We got a guy that's going to do a testimony. So anyway, I do my comedy and I'm in a bad place, really kind of where the title came from. And um, I'm on stage and I'm doing the comedy. We're going to laugh. And I stop. I'm ready to leave. And I go, you know what? I got to talk to you guys. I said, you know what? I'm exhausted. I just want to know when I'm done with this whole recovery thing and all of this stuff and God and all that. And I start crying. Mm -hmm. And these people are like, you talk about uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, yeah. You cry in front of Christians. They, they, you know, they go, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not in a bar, <laughs> not, in a not a comedy world. club. Not in a real world. Yeah, right. So it's like, anyway, I get done and Tammy looks at me. She goes, holy cow, what was that? I, go, I don't know, Tammy. I'm just exhausted. And I'm sitting there and I'm embarrassed. I mean, really embarrassed. And uh, right when I'm ready to leave, remember Jennifer O'Neill, the actress? Yeah. Summer of 42. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she was in the room. She walks over. She puts her arms around. She goes, I know exactly how you feel. And I looked at Tammy and I go, that's all I needed. Just one mm -hmm. person to go. I get it. I'm just tired. I'm tired of recovery. I'm tired of not being whatever situation I, whatever person I think I should be, you know, but I believe now that the Holy Spirit and my nature are just constantly, and it's just this. Paul talks about it in the uh, um, in, in in Romans. I I do the things I you know, my limbs mm -hmm. do things I don't want them to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're just this side of heaven. You know, um, but that's the. But there's just, there's a, there's a peace in the acceptance of the journey. I mean, and and again, oh yeah, I came to that years ago. I just realized, you know what, I'll never be done. You know, and okay, I'm fine with it. Yeah. You know, just, oh boy, you know, just another, you know. It does get, um, I think when you get, when you get older, I think that I, I've been, I don't know why I've been thinking about my life a lot, you know, the end of my life and, you know, wanting to make sure everything is in order for the kids and everything right. and. And uh, there's more and more times I get up and I'm like, like you just said, I'm tired of the battle. Right. And I used to tell my kids and they hated this. And up until two of them were in their thirties, they still hated it. And then the third, they got in the thirties and they're like, you know, dad, you're right. I said, life is flashes of wonderment, just flashes right. of, this is amazing. You have to live and feast on that because most of life is endurance. Just endure. Just right. keep working. Just keep moving forward. And it's well, hard. It's a, we were wired for two things, worship and service. And um, I had a sponsor give me trash bags once, and I said, what are these? And he said, when you feel like drinking or you don't want to go home because you're going to get in an argument with Tammy, you know, Serve. pick up trash. Mm -hmm. And I go, why would I do that? And he goes, trust me. And here's the yeah. hard part. Don't let anybody see you picking up the trash because your mm -hmm. pride will kick in and you'll miss the point. So I don't know, a week or two. Anyway, I always had these trash bags next to me in the car. you know. So I'm coming back and I know I'm going to get in an argument. And I just didn't want to go home. I stop at a 7-Eleven and I start picking up trash. And it worked. And then you realize it's just one more thing. You're going, you know what? Get off your rear end. And serve. I don't care if you're unemployed, you don't have anything, yeah. but find somebody that you could help and serve. You know, Ayn Rand, I read a lot of Ayn Rand, and it was interesting because she said altruism was selfish. It was an act of selfishness. Mm -hmm. And it, it is because you feel good. But I, I see, I believe the other way. God wired us <laughs> yeah. so that we would feel good when we serve. Correct, yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. It's like why he wired sex to feel good. Right. So we have babies. Right. So we can and, keep the and, species going. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, he wired us to feel good when we serve. And it's, 
It's so amazing because the things that make us feel good um, that are also good for us, yeah. I don't ever want to do. I like a service. I, I'll be in a bad mood or I'm saying, right. and service and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And then you do it, right? And you're coming home, and you're like, "Why don't we do this all the time? This right. is the way we should be." Right? And you know, like from from AA, when you walk in, yeah. and they go, "Pick up the chairs." Well, I don't want to pick up the chairs. Yeah, I want to whine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll pick them up. Yeah, and then you, you get out of your head, and again, you look at something you've you've done, you've done right. something, you know. And um, I just um, going back to the five questions because um, I, I uh, what defines you. Uh, what do you value? Um, you know, uh, initially I thought it was things. And Sticks. when we lost the house, when uh, we sold the home, finally we got out from under it. The escrow lady told us, the IRS has taken all the profit from your house. And I looked and said, it doesn't matter. The only thing of value is right here. Right here. And Tammy said, for the first time in our marriage, we were eight years in. She said, I believed you. For the first time I felt that we were a priority. And uh, who would have guessed the IRS <laughs> you know? did you a favor? Did me a favor yeah. by taking all of that. But it was uh, so. What do you value? What uh, What are your expectations? Huge. I used to tell Tammy, if you if you lower your expectations of me, you'd be a lot happier. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, like picking up underwear. You know, mm-hmm. it, 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 all right, it's so funny about the underwear because this is. She goes, how do you not see? I said, oh, my wife says this to me all I the said, time about but, everything. How do you not see this? But I, but I said to her, what you're saying to me is by ignoring it, you're saying I see it. I say to myself, I could pick it up, but screw it. I'm going to have her pick it up. Right. That's not true. I don't even see it. Right. I just walk right, <laughs> right. over right. it. Right. You know, there's no conscious. Right. The thing about it. But anyway, so that if you lower the expectations, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to be your champ. Right. But what, uh, yeah, what are your expectations? Uh, where does your hope lie? Um, that's huge because I, I, I see that in the airports. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book was for 30 to 40 year olds because I was that age when I went through all this. The meaninglessness of life, the, um, you know, um, hopelessness. I, you could feel it's like toxic for me. I see it. I want to walk over and just hug these guys and go, man, there's, there's another way. You know, there's another way. But it's so easy to isolate now. That's oh. that's the disease. It's Hopeless, so easy. Hopelessness, hopelessness, and loneliness. Yeah. Uh, and then on a society that's telling you you're no good, you'll never make it. It's right. just toxic. Yeah. Just toxic. It is, and it's it's sad. It really is. And young men, you know, you look at what what they're doing to anybody who tries to get young men esteemed. You know, yeah. Jordan Peterson, what he's had to go through. Um, um, uh, you know, I don't know about Andrew Tate. I don't know. I'm not that deep into that. I just know that his message was f- to, you know, strengthen up, be a man. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you look at what they did to Promise Keepers. Anytime large groups of men get together and they they esteem them, you know, uh, this is your role in life. You need to step up and be a good husband and be a good father. Be you know, and anything with family is under attack. Um, and that's another reason why I, I hope the book, I hope, I hope if you know, people read it and they're in a situation where they're just ready to give up, you know, hang in there, you know, at least give it a shot. You know, there's, there's ways out. If there's an effort, if you take divorce off the table, you know, um, <laughs> and my wife said to me, cause I had just gone through divorce and I had nothing, but I was like, prenup and <laughs> oh she was so mad at me she she's like we are not getting married we are not getting married and i'm like what i think that's pretty reasonable she said that we plan our right. demise no right. no yeah. and uh she was right you just have to take it off the table it's not an option not an yeah option. well that's it's interesting T- tammy said made a joke the other night she goes you know i married you for your money right <laughs> <laughs> and security and yeah, you know right. all of that you know i want to spend the rest of my life making her life comfortable i'm i want to pay penance for the man i was i really do i mean i have um 
there's times I look at, I, I do this in my show, so I, I know, you know, but it's she'll walk in. I call him Flint. God takes mm-hmm, Flint to your mm-hmm. heart. You know, you're sitting there, you know, mm-hmm. and she's walking back and forth. And then all of a sudden, psst, look at her. Psst, look yeah. at her. Just look. Right. Look, remember. Right. And then you go, oh, wow. Wow. Gorgeous. Yeah. And then you go, oh, oh that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> But that's uh, I, I love you. Yeah, Glenn, thank you so much. You're man. you are. Uh, I love you because you are a. I like wise people, and you only get wise after you've been through hell and back. Yeah, yeah. You're a wise man. Yeah. Smart people learn, you know. Yeah. yeah. What was the story about the alcoholic at a door here, and you got a brick wall? And bam, <laughs> bam. Someone goes, "Why don't you use the door?" Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, man.